Welcome back. Now, for Lawe Omikunle is a graduate of international law and diplomacy from the um, Diplomatic At Academy of London, University of Westminster. She is very passionate about education and has dedicated her life to tackling the challenges in, Ni in the Nigerian education sector. Mm -hmm. In 2017, she was named the 100 most influential young um, Nigerian. Um, do we have Folawe on Skype with us? Good evening, Folawe. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I don't know if you've been listening to Thank the conversation that we've had be, um, prior to now with the Commissioner for Lagos State. Yes. In your extensive yes. research that you've done about education in Nigeria, what would you think, you know, you want to sum the problem, the challenges, our struggles in the educational sector? Sorry, I didn't get your question. What is the challenge that we, you have seen in the educational sector in Nigeria? Oh, so, I mean, the challenges in the education sec sector, you know, is tremendous. It's, um, it's one where it, it cuts across access. It cuts across the fact that, I mean, which was mentioned during the interview with the commissioner, the fact that we have a significant number of children who are out of school. Um, it cuts across the fact that we have faulty um, and weak school systems and infrastructure. So, for example, you look at um, teachers, you look at teacher quality, and we know that, you know, we have a um, significant number, number of teachers who are unqualified and who are ill-equipped, you know, to deliver lessons and to teach. And um, we understand that we also have infrastructure issues. We just don't have enough schools to accommodate our, our children and our students. And um, we also have issues around, you know, just even the leadership and then um, funding around education. And so, you know, for me, when I think about what we're dealing with at the moment and what we've always had, COVID-19 has only come to amplify Thank what has, was already in the system. Like we've been dealing with an epidemic on it, in itself. We've been dealing with a crisis. And so on top of having this situation and this crisis that we're dealing with now, it's like double jeopardy. You know, so these issues have been there. You know, the fact that our students are in learning have been there. We've been seeing this across results from WIAC, and we've been seeing this across results from JAM. Like, this has been our system, this crisis that we're dealing with. But now it's been amplified. So on the average, do you think that the Nigerian teacher is equipped to actually um, deliver te um, lessons online? So I think that it goes beyond just the teacher. I think, you know, a lot, it, I've been on a lot of conversations where we're talking about, you know, like online teaching, remote teaching, distance learning, and all of these things. Like, I think the ecosystem itself is faulty. So you think about the ecosystem, it goes beyond the teacher. There is the school leadership itself. There is governance and leadership, you know, around curriculum. What are we teaching our kids? There is the situation around parents, like how are we engaging parents in the teaching and learning of our, of our children? So, you know, there are all of those different factors that it goes beyond just the teachers. We know that our teachers couldn't, for example, pass, you know, in a state, and in Kaduna State some years ago, where they had to um, write, um, be administered a primary four test. And we had 33,000 teachers write this test and 21,780 failed. And so when we think about statistics like that, at least as teachers that we're not going to place, you know, devices in their hands to start teaching. And bearing in mind that already the way the system is, when you look at JAM, JAM already attracts the teachers who are at the bottom of the pyramid. So in JAM, you're to score for, you know, the score is over 400. And for you to go and study an education program or education degree, all you need to score is 100 or 120. So already in the system, we're attracting those teachers or those individuals who ideally, majority of them should have no business in teaching, right? But we then put them in a system and then we haven't supported them to be able to guide independent learning and teaching, you know, amongst our students. So we currently have a system where, you know, it's, it's such a faulty system. And then we're just putting all these layers, you know, of solution. And if we don't address it from the root, we're just going to keep, you know, band-aiding um, these this issues. I think um, you've really summed it up for us. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you oh, so okay. much. Thank you very right, much. Thank you very now, much. Dr. Modupe Adefeso Olatuji Teju, sorry, Olatuji is an education policy expert with several years of research.
expanding the academic private sector. She received a PhD in education and international development from the Institute of Education, University of London, where her research probed the effectiveness of public and private schools in Nigeria. And she proposed a public private school partnership for that sector. Now, remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Waste Your Africa One with the hashtag Waste. I'm so sorry. We have so many questions coming okay. in. I don't know whether we can take one before we have Dr. Mo. Someone okay. has asked a question. I think she's from, um, so she's a concerned parent, like, um, um, like um, uh, what's her name was saying just now. Okay. She's a concerned Hello. parent. She was saying that she read from um, the net that Portacot uh, private schools will resume on the 27th of April online. Please, I want to ask, would parents be at home and access the portal or would the children come to school to access the portal? Her it's name is Echo Loseye. Okay. What do you think? I mean, every, everybody has to be in their homes. The essence exactly. of the social distancing is for exactly. us to stay at home, access the portal and learn. Although exactly. my own school, we had a bit of challenge on okay. Monday because they resumed online learning on Monday. How is that? It was too many people accessing the website at the, at the same, same time. time. So the, the website was down. You know? mm. So those are the struggles that I think some private schools are going to be having. There will be a lot of trial and errors before they actually get it right. So it's still at the um, so do we stage. Do we have Dr. Mo? Yes, we do. Hello. Hi, Hi Dr. Mo. Good. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> You're looking... <laughs> All right, so quickly, Dr. Mo, because we're running out of time. I saw your, your, your profile about the public-private partnership in education. You know, when we're talking PPP, everybody's talking maybe um, oil, everybody's talking um, power. Nobody has really thought about um, what's it called, the educational sector. What are you looking at when, you, when you're calling a PPP for the educational sector? Great, thank you very much for that question. I think that it's really important to think of partnerships in the education sector across a broad spectrum. And so we have very loose arrangements on the one end of the spectrum where persons who are in the private sector decide, for example, that they're going to contribute towards you know, providing some sort of facility in a school, all the way to a more structured system where you have contracts, where you have outsourcing, where you have opportunities, for the public and the private sector to really and truly enter into long-term and meaningful relationships. Um, and so when we think about partnerships, at the heart of it, I think, is the notion of collaboration. And I think that at a time like this, there's probably no better time to begin to think about how we can strategize on longer-term and more meaningful structured relationships between the public and the private sectors. And the reason I say that, Uju, is because children must remain at the heart of every intervention. And during a pandemic, we must continue to prioritize the learning of children. If children's learning is not our priority, what we're going to find is that we're going to be investing a lot in technology, we're going to be spending a lot of money training teachers and doing etc. But at the end of the day, we may not get the sort of outcomes that we're looking for. So we must never take our eye off that ball. And it is against that premise that I argue that the public and the private sectors need to come together more strongly. In terms of um, children's learning, okay, having a formal education enhances a child's cognitive, psychomotor, affective skills, and social skills as well. But now we are, we are, we are, we are actually experimenting with the online learning. Do you think that this can, the children can actually learn a lot through online learning? in terms of the psychomotor and other skills as well? Oh, absolutely. I think that we have to think about technology as a platform. And so it's, technology is a platform that enables you to layer on many opportunities to develop not only cognitive abilities and learners, but also affective abilities to help them think more empathetically about other people and about the situation of other people, to help them build values and morals and ethics but also to help them to build their own physical strength, also to help them to engage with their own physical environment. I'll give you an example. So we have a little garden in my house, and this has been a wonderful opportunity for us to take our little boy outside and show him how plants actually grow. In taking a watering can or just a little cup and pouring water into the soil and coming back every day and seeing shoots 
come out of the soil, he is learning a very valuable lesson. And he's using his fine motor skills. He's developing his um, physical abilities. And then we go to the internet and then we show him how that's done, you know, on the internet. So I think that there is a way by which you can um, integrate, you know, the opportunities for physical le learning at this point in time um, with that which happens online as well. So, uh, Dr. Mo, when you see education in Nigeria, where would you want our, the future of our education to look like? What, what would you want it to look like in, in Nigeria? My vision for the educated Nigerian is a person who is, and I'll speak to the individual Nigerian, is a person who, as this pandemic is showing us, is extremely flexible. It is the people that are flexible and adaptable. adaptable. It is the people that are creative that will not just survive the pandemic, but will thrive in the year after. And I also foresee a, a citizen, I see a citizen that has very strong cognitive abilities, who is able to reason critically. I see a citizen that has very strong moral, ethical uh, beliefs and values, and who is propelled by these values. And so for me, I see a well-rounded citizen a person who is able to contribute to, to, to not only for, to his or her own sustainable livelihood, but also to the livelihoods of other people. And that is why, for me, it is critical, absolutely critical, that in all of the interventions that have been uh, in, introduced in the education system and sector at this time, we must prioritize learning and learning in all its ramifications. So how do you think online learning will affect those with um, special, in special needs education? How do you think it will affect them? I think that we have a broad spectrum. Um, when you talk about special education needs, exactly. there are many different types of needs. There are learning you know, challenges, there are physical challenges, um, there, are, there are so many. There's such a broad spectrum. So it really does depend on what we're referring to. Now, if we look at the example that the Honorable Commissioner gave about radio um, school, well, clearly a learner who is um, visually challenged but can hear is able to derive some sort of benefit from that radio program, yeah. right? And exactly. when you have, for example, a television school or a television program where you also have sign language happening in the background, a learner who is challenged in terms of his um, auditory abilities can derive some benefit from that. I'm not saying these are perfect, but I am saying that these are the opportunities for us to really think very deeply about how we can leverage the platforms that are currently accessible whilst continuing to provide greater access to young people, particularly those who are disadvantaged in different ways, including through special needs as well. All right, so Dr. Mo, we know that education is not cheap anywhere in the world. The only thing that the government always, um, what they do to encourage people to go to school is to help with maybe things like scholarships and all of that. And that has really helped a lot of us. Even though some of us have gone abroad to go and study, we've been able to access those kinds of funds. So where would you say that, I mean, the role of the government, you know, in delivering this um, 21st century kind of education that we are hoping for in, a, in our near future? Whilst I don't believe that we should absolve the institution of government of its responsibility, I believe very strongly that in a democracy, government is both the public sector and the private sector. And this, for me, is why partnerships are critical at this point in time. I also understand that education is first and foremost, in its basic form, a human right. And so it's not just... Uh, an opportunity for young people to learn. Education is not just a pathway to a greater future. Opportunity is your right. Enshrined in Nigeria's constitution is the fact that the first, the one year of early childhood education, uh, six years of primary education, and three years of junior education is the right of every Nigerian child. And the upholder of that right is in the first place the government. So I believe very strongly that the government does have a lot of responsibility and I believe that um, as many other countries show us, there are creative ways by which we can harness a lot of resources for the education sector so that we can promote access to the right of young people um, to get a good education. Okay so, we have a, okay, so we have a question on WhatsApp. 
Someone says, despite the deep structural issues in our educational system, what can be done to bring teachers up to speed in order to deliver effective education to the children during this lockdown? I think that a lot of good work is already ongoing. I don't know whether the Honorable Commissioner had enough time to talk about some of the interesting things that are being done in Lagos State. Right now, I know that there is um, a mass approach training and capacity development of teachers. They're using multiple platforms, including the very humble WhatsApp. Um, I also know that there is a massive, massive public sector training um, that is a training a scheme that is currently ongoing. Um, remotely, and I'm talking of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of public servants, you know, in Lagos State, um, quite possibly happening in other states as well. But of Lagos State, I'm very, very sure. Um, I think that um, we have seen the rise of innovators and the providers of digital technologies come in and volunteer and offer resources, um, some of them as part of their corporate social responsibility, offering to train teachers in different aspects um, of not only pedagogy, but also of, you know, being able to use interactive technologies and new types of technologies that the world really must adopt at this time. So I think that there is a lot that is currently being done. And obviously, there's a lot more that needs to be done. I think that it's really important that as we focus on um, technology, we don't take our eyes off pedagogy as well. Okay. And helping teachers to really, really deepen their skills when it comes to teaching and understanding how learners learn. And of course, we mustn't also forget content knowledge as well. So making sure that a math teacher really understands math, really understands math, um, and then obviously can teach math as well. And the teacher can apply the maths to real life <laughs> issues. <laughs> because most times when we teach, we just teach abstract. Yes, exactly. That would be helpful. You, sorry, can you come back again? What did you say? I said that would be very helpful. Absolutely, very, very helpful. absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo. It was really Thank lovely you. having you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow, Isi. Interesting. We have so many questions. Um, wow. Someone says, okay. we talk about early education. How about higher learners and curriculum? You know, oh. we didn't talk about that. That that is um. So I think we should talk about that on another day you because know. that's another. Well, I think it, I think concentrating where? on the, the the foundation was mm -hmm. really key. It for was us. essential. It was, was so really essential key for us. because the children. In, uh, once you lose it in foundation, you've lost it totally. Children that don't know how to read at an early age tend to have difficulties when they get older. Well, Isi, as an educator, yes. like you rightly said. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, um, have you seen any government trainings? Have you attended any? And how is it like? Is it like a top notch? It is, I have. I, it is, sometimes it is interesting. Um, when you have, um, when you have to attend um, a government owned training, you know that you have to be, um, you have to prepare yourself for anything they give to you, wow. basically. And, Sometimes they, they, the content is there, but they just go through the, the, delivery. the delivery and it's not so good at the end of the day. Wow. Okay, I think we can leave it there. This was really power packed. Like, bah, exactly. bah, 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 right but we there. should do something on the higher education. We need to do that. We yes, need to do that. We, we didn't even scratch ASU and because ASU is saying they cannot yes. teach online. And yes. yeah, I know why. But I won't say it. I <laughs> want an expert to come the, and say they it. They don't have the facilities, <laughs> they don't have the resources because the federal government. And lecturers cannot, you can't pay for handouts. All and right, so please <laughs> watch a repeat broadcast of this episode tomorrow at 3 p.m. Now, remember to keep all, all our repeat airs for Mondays, Sundays, and um, Saturdays at 3 p.m. It's been very, very insightful, EC. Very Absolutely. insightful. Absolutely. Please keep the conversations going on all our social media platforms as we continue to hear what you are saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote, here it is again. If we teach today... As we taught yesterday, we rob our children of tomorrow. That's from John Dewey. I, I think it that. is very apt. Apt, yeah, absolutely. Very apt. So enjoy the rest of your evening. And stay safe. Stay safe. Always. <laughs> <laughs>